Uh, if you want to go ahead and be turning your Bibles, we're going to be in the book of Mark, Mark chapter 11. Uh, with this time of year, I want to kind of look at some things. Uh, I want to title this one, The Christmas List. The Christmas List. For centuries upon centuries, ever since right around the, the 300 A.D., uh, Mark, tradition has become that we celebrate the time of Christ's birth uh, around December. And there again, we could have a whole other lesson on when and where in the, in the different festivals that the, the Jewish people were, would adhere to and when it would look like it more, more than likely when Jesus was born. Uh, again, more toward, probably more towards September, but hey, let, we'll take it if they give it to us. It's December 25th. It's a day off, right? Uh, but we're going to take that, and we're going to make sure we emphasize the the whole meaning behind it, right? Whether it had origins, uh, you know, doing, dealing with pagan times and stuff like that. Hey, yeah, that probably did happen, but right now, this is where we're at. This is what the focus is, and we're going to make sure we give him all the glory that we possibly can. Amen? We can find things. I don't think the devil's got an, a, enough foothold on everything else that we need to find a way to you know, take something back, right? And so we're going to take that time. We're going to use these, especially these four weeks between Thanksgiving when we're giving thanks to God and the four weeks of greed and, you know, and all that stuff that comes along with it uh, and to presenting the time uh, of Christ's birth. But along with that comes the, the giving and exchanging of gifts, and somewhere along the line, the tradition went away from what the common folklore, the tradition uh, story account of uh, St. Nicholas and how he would give to children in his town and stuff like that. And he would give to orphans and then to the needy. And it was somewhere, I couldn't actually find a good timeline that it switched from a point of, hey, let's give to those in need to, hey, let's give to everybody. And matter of fact, what do you want? not just what you need. Give me a list of what you want for Christmas, right? How many, how many times do we hear that? We may even say those same words, hey, what do you want for Christmas? Well, it's not, and it's not so much what do I want anymore as it should be what do I need if it's going to be that. That's the true meaning behind the giving and exchanging of gifts in the beginning. If we go all the way back to the beginning, whether whatever time of year it was, that when God looked at us and he says, I want to give them something, what is it that I could give them with, you know, through the, it basically came down to our greatest need, and that was Jesus Christ. Salvation, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. God looked at us and he said, hey, I know what they want. I, can, I know their thoughts and intents of their hearts. I know their imaginations. I know their deeds. I know all that. I know every single aspect of those humans' lives. But what is it that they need that I can give them? And so he gave us Christ. Now, maybe you've already been making out a list and stuff like that. It's interesting that uh, in my family, Thanksgiving is a time when my family gets together and we, you know, we overeat, that's for sure. But at the same time, it also becomes part of the tradition now is that there's a moment of saying, hey, you know, all right, let's exchange names. And, hey, what does so-and-so want? What do you think so-and-so wants? And so that becomes part of the even of giving Thanksgiving. And uh, I don't know about you, but um, it, it, I've had several people that say, hey, what do you want for Christmas this, this year? And I'm trying to minimalize this year. For some reason, I don't know, it's just, maybe I just got too much junk and I'm tired of moving it from one corner to another corner, you know, and boxes, I still got boxes in my garage from when we first moved here, and it's kind of like, you know, it's, they're there, and it's like, I'd really just love to clean this thing out and just, you know, not even have a yard sale, just donate it to Goodwill and just say, get rid of it, and to minimalize as much as we possibly can, and that's got this, this mindset of, well, as well as she's been watching documentaries and stuff like that, of uh, becoming not so much of a minimalist, all right, but at least getting rid of some stuff. So, you know, just let me know your shirt sizes and pant sizes and shoe sizes and stuff like that. Maybe I can deck you out or something like that. But we, we want to minimalize how much, let's just say the word, junk that we have in our life, not just in material things, but also in things that take up our time, Things that, you know, don't allow us to enjoy spending more time with each other or going to see the grandkids more often or visiting you guys. And y'all know how my schedule is. That, you know, it's kind of like, where are you going to find that time? Well, I think if I can eliminate some of these things in my life that I do 
things that I want more so than I need, I can actually find more time to do the things that I needed to do. And we, we all can do that. And so as I'm thinking over my Christmas list for this year of things that I could use, things that I would need, right? And it's kind of like, okay, well, you know, this can apply on a spiritual level as well. And here in the book of Mark, chapter 11, Jesus has some things that he's going to say to us, uh, verses 22 through 26. And basically what we need to do is we need to reevaluate, to review, if you will, the, the, the desires of our heart. Now here, let's go ahead and read this. Mark chapter 11, 22 through 26. And Jesus answering said unto them, he said, have faith in God. I could take that one sentence right there that he said, and boy, we could preach a whole month and a half just on that. Have faith in God. For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and cast in the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that, uh, that those things which he hath said shall come to pass, he shall have whatever soever he has, or he saith. Therefore I say unto you, whatsoever things ye desire, when you pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. And when you stand praying, forgive. If ye have aught against any, that your Father also, which is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, y'all... So many times I just want to stop at verse number 25, but i got to do 26. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. But in these, in these verses, what he's talking about here, he's saying, you know, whatever you desire, pray, believing that you're going to receive. Now, another passage of Scripture says that we are to have to our, set our affections on things above. We're also to have our, our desires are to be his desires. Our extreme example of how we should be living our life is that of Christ, is it not? To be Christ-like is to be like Christ. Ooh, that was deep theology right there, right? That we are to be like him. And so what is his desire? What is his prayer? And, you know, we can look all just, just to the Garden of uh, Gethsemane and just look at the one prayer that we see. And there's many prayers that Jesus uh, prayed through his, his time on earth. But that one, and that phrase that he uses there, and he says... Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. The desire of Christ is that God gets what he wants in our life, in other people's lives. And so we're going to look at a, a few things that just say, hey, there's a Christmas list that we as believers should have in our life, not just this time of year, but it's a good time for us to focus on that and say, here's my Christmas list. And you could actually use this this time of year when people start talking to you. Hey, what do you want for Christmas this year? Well, matter of fact, here's four things in particular that I, that I want. Number one would be that, which should be on my list, is that more people come to Christ. What is my heart's desire? What do I want for Christmas? I would love to see at least one person between now and Christmas come to the saving knowledge of Christ. How cool would that be? Now, grant it. I would love to see more than just one, right? But you know what? If we just look at it and just say, you know what? If I can just make a difference in one. If I could speak life to just one. That's huge. Matter of fact, statistically, if we, can, if we just took in one year, if we were able to help somebody come to Christ, just one person out of 365 days a year, if we would just do one, we would be doing more than 90, 92% of the people that sit in any church on any given Sunday in that year. That's huge. More people come to Christ, you know, but, you know, at, at an altar service or revival service or youth camps or evangelistic, you know, campaigns and things like that, more so than just one-on-one -on -one conversations. And a lot of it has to do with what we were just singing about that we don't have. I'm no longer a slave to fear. What, what if they say something about me? Chances are they already are. What, what if they don't like me? Then they can never fault you for trying to be a true friend. Right? That if we could, if we could find a way to grasp a hold of the life of Christ and say, I want to be like him in this way. I know we can't be perfect like he is, right? Because he was sinless. 
but we can sin less. And if we could find in our life to say, you know what? Greater love hath no man than this, and a man lay down his life for his, what? For his friends. If we got friends, then you know what? How do we lay our deck a bullet for so-and-so? Wait, whoa, kind of pushing it there, all right? I would, I would do this. I would, I would give up a promotion so that so-and-so w- could get it. I've seen that happen before. But are you willing to lay down the life of being a close friend by telling them about Christ. Let's look at it like this. What are you willing to give up so that somebody can hear about Christ? Sometimes our Christmas list isn't so much about what we need to get, but what we need to give. For it is more blessed to give than it is to receive, right? And so when we look at our life, we're kind of like, Okay, I, yeah, it's easy. It's so Christianese, you know, to, to say, oh, yes, I want to see people come to Christ. But are we willing to be part of that? And sometimes it is so easy just by just talking with somebody, just giving them a moment to, to express what's on their heart and to find that opportunity of inserting Christ in that hole in their life. And say, you know what, let me talk to you about this. Let me, you know, hey, I tell you what, I, I hear what you're saying. And do you mind if I pray for you about that? That lets them know that you're, you're willing to listen, but at the same time, you're willing to take it to another level beyond us. That shows that you care. So would you say that it's one of the first things that's on your Christmas list if somebody was asked you this past Thanksgiving and say, hey, what do you want for Christmas? Was this the first thing you thought of? No, it wasn't. Was it mine? No. You know, what am I thinking of? I'm thinking of, you know, wrench sets, socket sets, drill bits, you know, you know the man stuff. You know, that, that stuff I could fill my, ta- my toolbox with. It used to be tackle box, you know, that was a couple years ago. But, you know, fill my toolbox with so that I can build stuff or tear stuff down. I'm more good at tearing stuff down than a building. But the thing is, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's what's on my mind, things like that. Far be it from us to exclude God from the equation this time of year. So one of the things that we need to have on our, our list for Christmas that we need and we definitely need more of is more people to come to Christ. The second thing kind of falls right behind that because if it's funny when you know people that don't have a problem with their weight tell me how to lose weight. Do you ever have people, <laughs> I don't know if you ever have people like that. You know, there's some people that they can eat five, bi- there's a guy at work, he can, he can sit there and he's actually been run out of a, an all-you-can-eat restaurant. He ate all the crawfish at an all-you-can-eat uh, crawfish festival uh, at a restaurant that they were having. And he, he, he can, this guy can just eat and he's like this skinny, you know. And he, and to sit there and hear, I'm just like, you know, I gotta purposely not eat, you know, so that I don't gain weight. You know, I can look at a box of donuts, which I bought one. I bought one this morning. I shouldn't have. But I can look at a box of donuts, you know, especially Tuesday night. Last couple Tuesday nights, if you love donuts, you should have been here the last two weeks. And it's kind of, I mean, it's you, you just, oh, it's Krispy Kreme, and you can just smell it. Oh, especially if you stop while the sign's on and you have it sitting in the passenger seat beside you, and it just. And then it just fills your car. We had a young guy that used to work at Krispy Kreme. He was living at our house for about three months. And man, his the bedroom that he was in, even after he moved out, you just walk in there, he's like, and it just smells like Krispy Kreme. It's like, oh. They go, <laughs> you know. But then there's, there's people that have never had a problem with their weight, and they start telling, hey, this is what you need to do. This is what you need. And it's kind of like, you just don't know. If we don't live a life that shows people that, yes, hey, I'm a sinner, saved by grace, every day is a challenge for me, I still stumble, I still fall, you know, we won't be able to do point number one, we won't be able to lead more people to Christ if point number two on our Christmas list isn't that that we should desire to follow the Lord more closely. Because if we're not choosing Christ, why should they? 
I mean, that's a hard pill to swallow right there. If I tell you, say, hey, you need to try this restaurant. Hey, oh, wow, okay, that sounds like a good restaurant. When, when are you going? Oh, I'm never going back there. Well, why? Food was terrible. Well, why are you telling me to go? If you're not willing to go, right? You know, well, it's a nice place. They have nice decorations, but the food's horrible. I'll never go back there. You'll never see me setting foot on that property ever again. But feel free to go. Good prices. But who's going to go to that restaurant? You see the spiritual application of that. Hey, you need to follow Christ. The product, my dad has this one phrase that he uses, that the product must validate the claim. Otherwise, it's false advertising. And the same thing in our spiritual life. If we say, choose Christ, and we're not choosing Christ, we're not following him more closely, people's going to look at it. And here's a cool, another thing, is those people that are closest to us, especially, will say, you know what? I hear what you say to the pastor on Sunday morning, but I also hear what y'all say to each other Monday through Saturday. Our neighbors, you know, whether it's the, you know, the pastor's neighbors or, or, or what, is kind of like, yeah, I hear what you say from the pulpit. I hear what you say, it is, but I also hear what you say at work. Our life must reflect that we are wanting to grow closer to the Lord. Otherwise, point number one, we won't see more people coming to Christ. So yes, our, our Christmas list must be that we need to see, want to see more people come to Christ, a closer walk with the Lord. Number three would be that we would have a desire for more opportunities to serve Him. More opportunities to serve Him. And you say, how can I serve the Lord? You know, do I have to go and do this, this big mission project? You know, you know, do I have to go help Habitat for Humanity and help build houses? Do I need to go to Nicaragua and help build a church? Or do I need to go, you know, serve with a missionary in Papua New Guinea or England? Or do I need to do these big things? You know, Jesus said, if you just give a, a glass of water to someone that needs a glass of water, you are serving me. He said, whatever you do to the least of these around us, he says, you do to me. So we can look at it and say, you know what? When you're driving down the road and you wave at somebody, I'm serving the Lord. With all five fingers, please. Right? You know? When you allow somebody to enter a door before you and you hold the door open for them, guess what? You're serving the Lord. If you hand somebody a glass of water, you're serving the Lord. Whatever you do to those around you, whatever their need is, and you've helped fill it. If you let somebody have a closer parking spot in, in, at the big store, you know, you just have to walk for more. You're blessing somebody. You're serving the Lord. You say, but I may not talk to them. I may not, I may not have the opportunity to tell them about Christ. But you're not hindering it from happening from someone else. So many times what we do is we say, oh, well, I, you know, I'm not having that opportunity for that one-on-one -on -one conversation, so therefore, I'm not going to make a difference. Let's think about this from a beach perspective. If we go down to the beach, and I've almost drowned twice, so I'm quite familiar with the process, all right? And if, if we were to go to the beach, and we go out there in the water, and you start to drown, right, the lifeguard, if you're there close by a station, he comes out or she comes out. They rescue you. They bring you back to land. That's pretty cool, right? Now, what if that lifeguard stand, stands there and sees you doing that, and they're like, ah, my trainer would probably be better off saving that individual's life. But the trainer's not there, right? The lifeguard is. Now, the trainer, if they're walking down the beach and they see something happening, they could sit there and say, well, you know, the lifeguard's here. He can get it. Or the trainer could go ahead and do something about it. In the spiritual context of this is that we as Christians, so many times what we do is we're like, so-and-so would be better trained to do this. So-and-so would have a better opportunity to do this when the need is right in front of us. Whatever it is. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with thanksgiving. Enter into his courts with praise. All these things jive with more opportunities to serve him. 
whether it's serving in the church, whether it's serving in the community, whether it's serving wherever you just happen to be. We need to pray that God will let us have more opportunities to serve him. Point number four, the last thing that we, there's more things we could list, but it, we, just for the sake of time, four things. The Christmas list for us believers, more people to come to Christ, a closer walk with the Lord, more opportunities to serve him. And then point number four would be to recognize the difference between wants and needs. Wants and needs. Sometimes even that falls into a spiritual situation, if you will. Is that when we come in, you know, sometimes we're like, man, I, I just want an, an experience. I want, I want something to happen that just shakes my cage. Well, is that what you need? I want, man, I want God to just move in a mighty way. I want, I want to, I just want his presence to come in and just shake the walls. But maybe what we need is the still small voice. And then sometimes we come in and it's like, God, if you would just speak to me in that still small voice, God, just, if you would just oh, bring a peace. But maybe what we need is the mighty Russian wind. Maybe what we need is, you know, the fire from heaven to fall. Maybe what we need is the whirlwind to happen in our life. Maybe we do need the walls to shake, you know, in order to get our attention, in order for us to be moved. You know, it's kind of like, if you look at, here, here's two examples in, in the scriptures. You have Elijah, and he's up in the middle of a cave, and he's hiding for his life. And the, the wind comes by, the, you know, the tornado comes by, the fire comes by, and God was in none of that. And, but in that still small voice, that's when he heard him say, hey, what are you doing here? But then if you go to the New Testament and you got Paul and Silas and they're in prison, they're in chains, they're in bondage down in the dungeon and they're standing there and guess what happens? That The earth did shake, that there was an earthquake and that's exactly what both of these guys needed. What happens to me may not be what you need. Sometimes we look at examples, we hear testimonies, and we're like, man, God, if you would just do something like that for me, that would be awesome. That's not what you need. God, I want so badly for this. Here's, here's one that we hear quite often in a lot of people's lives. God, I want this job so bad. God, I want this to happen in my life. God, I want this. And God's like, that's not what you need. You keep, you keep hounding me about it. Sure, I'll give you what you want. But hopefully through that process, you'll find out that it's not what you needed, and then we'll have to fix it later on. You say, is that, wait a minute. It's, you're, you're talking about that we should pray and believing. Yes, if our desires are that that is according to his will, not ours. A few weeks ago, we even kind of mentioned this in, in, in a passage of Scripture dealing with the children of Israel, that as they were going out in the wilderness, that they were actually out there and God was providing them six days a week with manna from heaven, exactly what they needed. And so, and they're like, wow, this is, this is, at first it was like, well, God's providing. And then it became, uh, oh my goodness, you know, once again, here we got this stuff, you know, that we got to deal with. And they're like, oh, if we could just have meat. And it kept nagging and nagging and nagging. God's like, is that what you want? Yes, we desire meat, we loathe, we, de we despise this white bread. And so God's like, okay, I'm going to give you exactly what you want. And the Bible says that even while the meat was still in their teeth, they started dropping like flies, dying. God's like, oh, I'll give you what you want. But in doing so, you're going to recognize what your need is. Let's not get to that point, right? Right? Let's not let, get it to the point where God has to prove himself to us. May we desire the things of God. May we desire to have his heart to be just like Christ. And so that in every aspect of our life we say, you know what, it's not what I want, but what do I need? What is an agreement to your will in my life? And completely honest with you, Sometimes that's difficult. It's the most easiest difficult thing we've ever done, to follow the leading of the Lord. Why? Because it gets us out of our comfort zone. It usually does that. So there's a Christmas list for us as believers, and hopefully we can learn from this. Hopefully we can apply it to our lives so that in 
all in all, so point number one can happen, that is that more people will come to know Christ through our lives. Father God, we thank you for this day. God, we thank you for the opportunity to preach your word. God, we thank you for these that are here and those that are watching online. God, we pray that each of us will examine ourselves, God, to see what is it that we need for Christmas this year from you. And God, maybe more importantly, we should ask the question is, what do you need from us? God, we pray that you would um, be with us during this prayer time, God, and moving as you see fit upon our hearts. In Christ's name we do pray. Amen.